I'm uh, quite excited about this uh, group of panelists. My name is John Doerr. Uh, in the spirit of full disclosure, I'm a venture capital investor, and I've invested in the work of every one of these world-class <laughs> designers. <laughs> but I did not select this panel. That honor goes to Kitty Boone, who's uh, the grand, uh, grand organizer of this conference. Kitty. Our topic today is design how design transforms the world, how it empowers, ennobles the human spirit, uh, how, how it helps us all make more meaning out of life. And so we have truly four of uh, the world's greatest designers or designers and executives uh, to tell us about this topic. I hope we can spend a lot of time on questions. We have but two mics, but we want this time to be uh, your time. And so I'm gonna introduce each of them they're a, a little too modest, I think, to do justice to their stature in the world. And, and then I'm gonna ask them about their highest volume, most outrageous design ever, so you can be prepped for that. Uh, Eve Bihar is a designer and an entrepreneur, and he's also a big advocate of sustainability. And uh, he, he helps companies, when they're starting, uh, create their designs and make them really vital and beautiful, gets ownership in those companies for that work. He's the chief creative officer of Jawbone, right? Mm -hmm. And so exactly. we'll have a lot to hear from uh, Bihar. Mike McHugh is a third time Kleiner Perkins backed entrepreneur, CEO, founder of Flipboard. How many people here use Flipboard? All right. All right, so the rest of you should. You How many of you have can. up Jawbone bands? Hands in the air? The rest of us should. And so Mike's journey into, into design began with a company called Paper Software that he uh, sold to Netscape. He was Netscape's chief technical officer, all these browsers. And then he left the visual web to go to the voice web and create a company called Tell Me, which if you ever dial AT&T for long distance information or reservations on airlines, that's powered by Mike's work. And, and then he'll tell us the story about Flipboard, but he founded uh, Flipboard together with his uh, more significant other, Marcy McHugh, who's here in the audience and runs all their marketing. Marcy, there you are. Great job, Marcy. <laughs> Dave Morin, to Mike's left, is, uh, a, a, as several of us are, veterans of Apple Computer, which is where uh, I think Dave first began his love of design. And then he went over to Facebook, and he created the Facebook platform, and also something called Facebook Connect. So when you're on the internet, if you're ever trying to connect easily to a service, we have Dave Warren to thank for that. But the very best work that he's uh, doing in his career is a company called Path. Now I'm gonna ask another survey. How many of us are Path devotees and users? Uh, this you, is a highbrow group. Good. You win, McHugh. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see what Tony's still, still on. Five. How many of you are not that yeah. Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll let Dave tell you about PATH, but it's a, it's a powerful, really private, personal network, kind of a, a diary that you can track the moments in your life. And then there's my friend Tony Fidel, who uh, directly worked for Steve Jobs for many, many years. And Tony produced 18 generations of the iPod. He's considered to be the father of the iPod, so he invented that first device that excuse me, is this over the top, you know, like transform music and <laughs> the music industry, and, and that's a remarkable accomplishment. And, and then, uh, not to be outdone, he has a vision he's gonna tell us about for uh, making our lives and our homes uh, safer, more intelligent, smarter, connected, uh, in the form of a company he founded by the name of Nest, whose very first product is a runaway winner. He reimagined, reinvented the thermostat, so that's, Tony, we're gonna to hear from him. But I'm gonna ask of each of you, what's the most outrageous design, perhaps in volume, that you've been responsible for? Eve? So, outrageous or yeah. quantity? So outrageous, I don't know if it's outrageous, but I, I designed a New York City condom, which is distributed for free. Um, uh, 39 million of them gets, get distributed every year. Um, now what sets apart this condom? <laughs> well, let me just say, bef before, before our design, it was in a sort of pink you know, envelope of sorts, um, and it said lifestyle on it or something like that. Um, and they were distributing 9 million for prevention, AIDS, and, mm. and uh, teen pregnancy prevention. 
And then once we launched, they, they, they were distributing, they're distributing now 39 to 40 uh, a year. 40 million so, a year. So um, that was just changing the packaging, making ni nicer dispensers. How, how did you improve this design? Um, not the condom itself, no. <laughs> <laughs> just the packaging. <laughs> If, you know, but New York New Yorkers thought they needed you know a special version. Um, I'll do let you imagine what they they thought they needed. Do you have one? Not on me, no. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, your most successful design? Well, probably my most successful design would be uh, the the flip uh, and flipboard, yeah. uh, and it wasn't really just me. It was the whole team, but uh, it was kind of an accidental thing where. We wanted to create, uh, first of all, the notion of pagination for content, yeah. uh, similar to a magazine, but we didn't want something that was too, uh, too flourishy or too skeuomorphic, as they say in the industry. Uh, and so we wanted a kind of a plastic flip. And uh, we, we thought of the train station with the, those flip, flipping tiles, those flip boards. And, uh, and somebody, one of our engineers, just decided, you know, while we were searching for what the right transition was to mock up this flip. And we tried it, and we just fell in love. And uh, so that was probably our most successful design. And in the very team. first product, is that right? In the very first product, yeah. You, or in, in Flipboard. You have designers in your company, right? Yes, we have uh, four designers in our company. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but the whole company is you know, inspired by Apple. A lot of people came from Apple. You know, really, the DNA is really about you know, designing great product. And so it's been, from the very beginning, part of it, the DNA. Right. Dave Morin, uh, your company, Path, has been described as a design-first company in that you are a designer. Let me ask you the same question. What is your most successful and outrageous design? Outrageous. Uh, probably by, I mean, by volume, it's probably the Facebook Connect button. Yeah. Um, How many times do you think that's been used? That's pretty hard to call. Um, <laughs> probably trillions. Trillions. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, there's another feature, that one's hard to call, and I've, I'm sort of so far out of it, it's, it's hard to know how, how big it's, it's gotten. But um, in Path, we have a feature called Seen It, which um, is a subtle, but uh, it's a subtle feature that unless it turns off, you don't realize that it's there. Um, and once it turns off, you really, our users start to go really super crazy uh, if it goes away. And it simply just shows you uh, who's seen your photo uh, when you put it, put it on Path. And, We've done hundreds and hundreds of billions of those. Um, so many so that we don't even keep track of it anymore because there, uh, there's so many of them. Uh, how how many paths, again, have been? How many what? Paths have been uh, downloaded. How many? Oh, uh, that's, that's pretty hard, too. Uh, oh, how many moments have been generated? No, 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 users. Oh, users, uh, almost 18 million. 18 million. Yeah. And Mike, how many users have Flipboard? About 70 million users and about um, Probably about 100 million flips so far. 100 million flips, wow. Tony, your most successful or outrageous design. <laughs> well, you know, there were different generations, the iPod or the iPhone, but really the, the thing that was outrageous design um, was the 30-pin connector on the bottom of oh, all those yeah, products, yeah. right? Every, Let's hear it every, for the 30-pin connector, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's still causing problems. It's still causing yeah. problems, but in every hotel room, right? Every car, the, we, it was just a runaway success in every which way, yeah. um, connecting all kinds of things together that you never would have connected. Until now it's changed it. Until they, you know, <laughs> yeah. until they Replaced by it. lightning. <laughs> Tell me, what were you thinking when you invented that iPod? What was I thinking? Yeah. <laughs> well, at the time, I was, you know, I was a consultant. And so what I was definitely thinking was, I need to take this consultancy role because I need the money to help my startup <laughs> company. So that's how it got started, right? Because, you know, Apple wasn't the Apple we know of today, right? Apple was really, really hurting back in the day, even with Steve back. It was, you know, it had $150 million in, uh, in, in, in the bank and $500 million in debt. And through that, you know, now today, 150 billion in the bank. Most, very, most, very different. Not, not due to me. Most but. valuable company in the world, I think. Yeah. Even most, so. most valuable. So what I was thinking was really just about, you know, sustenance, survival. those kind of survival <laughs> for my, for my, uh, for my little startup. But after, you know, Steve really, you know, I said, Steve, how are we going to go up against Sony? And he goes, You make it. Trust me, we're going to put every marketing dollar we have behind it. We're going to make this happen. <laughs> and it, he really, uh, he really did. You know, you know, uh, live up to that, and let's, it was great. It was wonderful. Let's go a little bit further on that. How was it working with Steve on design? I imagine the two of you clashed sometimes. You know, <laughs> there there are two different types of 
uh, design decisions. Some are fact-based and others are opinion-based, right? And so with facts, usually over time, if you got the right facts and he believed how you created the data or, or found out the data, he would go, okay, I understand, we're gonna go that way. But then on the opinion-based pieces, you know, what color was it gonna be or exactly that shape or exactly that corner, you know, you'd go, oh, it's gonna jab in your hand or it's gonna patina in this way or it's gonna scratch. It's like, you know, you really had to come, I couldn't just, I could have an argue with it, but he always, you know, would always win. We had to come as an army. So it would have to be a bunch of us together, and we'd all go, yes, this is not the right thing. No, no, this is not right. And then we get in a room, and then hopefully we look all around and go, now. And we would just, we'd go at him. And then sometimes he would relent, and other times, no, that's the way it's going to be. But it never always, we didn't always win by any means, but... Uh, it was a wonderful experience because he really pushed you in every different dimension, whether it was the UI or a pixel or a color or a shape or what have you. And so it was an incredible learning experience and I wouldn't change that. For I've, I've heard that as an entrepreneur and a CEO who's design inspired that you have uh, embraced, extended, adopt some of many of Steve's traits as a leader. Would you say that's true? <laughs> yes, I'm unrelenting as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, there, there, there's some differences between, you know, uh, between what we do today and what we did at, at Apple at the time. But we have a lot of the same people from the team. So we, the things that we created and how we created, very, very similar. But, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the big differences, I think, um, between between what we did at Apple and what we do at Nest is, you know, it's really about making sure it's a, a holistic design with the whole team, really feeling like they were the ones mm -hmm. who designed that, mm -hmm. right? You want to make sure you transfer the ownership mm -hmm. and, and the ideas to yeah. the younger guys on the team and feel like they have a real part and a real passion right. around it so that they're incentivized in some way to make sure that that thing exists. And then that was a very, very different dynamic. And then before happened. they do a review with you, do they all go in the room together and lock arms? And yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> they do some of the same exact techniques where we would we literally would say, okay, there's gonna be these three models, these options, we're gonna make sure it's perfectly right. And Steve says, just show it to me. No, Steve, no. we're gonna do it this way. We're gonna, do, and now my team's doing that the to me. The same thing back to you. It's doing the same thing to me. And it, you know, it's wonderful because they're creating their own culture, right? right? It's, a, it's a great thing to see. So, so Dave, how much Apple influence is there in your company? Your company's design and, and your design aesthetic? 100%. It's 100%. Um, I mean, it, it's, it runs really deep. Um, you know, the opportunity to be at Apple in that, in that time frame uh, was extraordinary. Um, even, you know, I was just thinking back during the original iPod days, my job was marketing at Apple. And uh, we, you know, nobody remembers when we couldn't sell the iPod. Right? And uh, the first year I was there, we actually gave iPods to every student at Duke University uh, just to, you know, to try to get them out there. And, uh, you know, so I think you know, Apple's commitment to uh, long-term ideas, to you know, investing, to you know, not just create de the design, but to really commit to an idea over the long term, I mean, that permeates path uh, through and through. You know, the strategy that we're pursuing is uh, not, a, not an easy one. Uh, and it takes takes a long period of time, and so um, you know Apple just I think permeates everything. Mike, is there an Apple influence in your company? Well, in the sense that when I sit down in front of an Apple product, you know I feel like I whatever work that I'm doing needs to live up to the design of that Apple product. It inspires me, and, uh -huh. and I think it, a lot of people who it's kind of the new blank sheet of paper when you sit down in front of an Apple product you feel like, okay, you're working with the best paper, the best materials, and now you're, it's up to you as a craftsperson to do something great. You had a famous sneak preview showing of your product to Steve Jobs. How did that, Thanks meeting, to you. How did yes. that meeting go? Yeah, well, uh, John brought uh, Steve by the office uh, on Sunday morning during one of John's walks with Steve, and he kept calling uh, months beforehand saying, you know, Mike, can I bring Steve by the office? I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> and uh, I was very, very worried about it because, uh, you know, I had, I've never really had interacted with Steve. I met him a couple times briefly, but, you know, I'd heard all these stories and how he would just rip a design to shreds, you know, and so I was, I was scared to death. And, uh, and I wanted the product to be as good as it could possibly be before I showed it to him. And, uh, but uh, finally, I think it was about a month and a half before we shipped, um, John finally convinced me that it was time to show Steve the product. So I alerted my team, 
told them, don't be afraid if he says a lot of things that you know are not <laughs> kind to the design. <laughs> and, uh, and I was, uh, I mean, it was probably the most intense, best meeting of my entire life. And because I had looked up to him as a, as a designer, as a role model. And, and he just, you know, again, I tried to give a preview. He just took the iPad from me. He's like, let me see it. <laughs> and he sat there and he used the product for must have been 20 minutes. It seemed like an eternity. Went through every corner of the product, the entire thing. And he didn't say a word. And, uh, and uh, maybe asked a question here and there. Then he handed it back to me. He goes, it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, <laughs> well, and you went on to be named iPad App of the Year. It was, uh, I mean, we were honored. Good thing by that, that you did. Eve, are you a critic of Apple's design? I'm actually of uh, two minds here because it's a little bit too much of an Apple fest right now. Yeah, that, that was hoping. <laughs> <laughs> so, so on the one hand, you know, uh, Steve Jobs and Apple certainly have made my life a lot easier, um, and have. Uh, made things like this possible. I mean, I don't think five or ten years ago um, we would have had a design panel right. with, um, you know, with a with a venture capitalist as, without, uh, as a without, moderator. Without these, right? Um, we would not. I mean, I know you've had a, a long interest in design, so it may have happened, but I think maybe just only with you. Um, and so, on the one hand, you know, uh, Apple has created this this um, this focus on design that we all um, that we all understand. I mean, all of us, everybody out there is uh, is much more conscious of design thanks to Apple. On the other, I've spent my career in meetings with people, you know, walking in and saying, "Oh, well, we want to be the Apple of this," or <laughs> "Can you make it look like an Apple?" And I'm like, every single time, it's you know, I, I had to. Um, quite strongly to explain to a, a notion to them that I, I even think in this room um, would be worth um, kind of thinking about, which is there isn't just one way to do good design. And it's been, you know, the, 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 the consciousness out there has been that, well, it's either Apple or it's, you know, not worth looking at. Mm. And I've worked pretty hard at sort of building design languages that um, Apple would never have done. And yet, um, I hope they're you know solid, long-lasting uh, design languages. And what's an example love. of one of those? What's a design I mean, language the, they the, never would have done? Like the the, like the jam this, box. Like, like this thing, maybe? <clears throat> um, no. I, I don't. I, I know less about this. I mean, I, I know about this product obviously because I've designed it. But I, it's not it's not something that Apple, the wearable sort of space, um, outside of earbuds and whatnot, isn't something that um, I can imagine until the next product comes out uh, what <laughs> Apple uh, is going to do with that, mm. with that. But that said, the Jambox, for example, for me, the use of textures and tactility, um, the fact that the product kind of, you have an iconic uh, product from like 15 feet away, from six feet away, there's other elements that start to intrigue you. And then as you start touching it, there's elements of textures and that start res responding to you. The notion of that, the notion of giving a lot of choices, colors, um, the notion of really letting people make the products their own rather than just giving them a silver or a white you know version you know those things um you know i i i think there's a lot of there's a few companies now building their own languages and i think they're doing excellent work and it's mm. not apple work it's not just apple but it might have been apple inspired okay let's get personal here for just a moment I'd, i'm going to ask each panelist about their personal journey a moment in their life that maybe they've never told anybody about how they discovered design and influenced their life. And I also, starting with Tony, would like them to explain their personal choice of footwear. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 will, I will talk about those. I, I love them. Where did you get me? Where, I did, got did them you, online. Did you, Absolutely, did you, actually, Zappos.com. Did you roll some guy in a restroom to get those? <laughs> <laughs> I have multiple colors. No, I love, I love flat sole shoes. They're, 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 they're absolutely the best way to, to, to walk, I, I, at least in mine. And they have to be cool looking. At least yeah. I think they are. Yeah. But, uh, but no, really, where did I come to appreciate design? I think, you know, I grew up in basements. I grew up in garages building things. And, you know, you're always in just the bits and the, you know, and, and screws and what have you. And it wasn't really until I went to work at a company called General Magic. Mm. And General Magic was the creators of the Macintosh, starting a new product, uh, starting a new company that literally was the iPhone 20 years earlier. 
And that's when those guys who worked with Steve for so, and gals, who worked with Steve so intently on building the Macintosh, that's where I got to appreciate design in terms of not just the visual, but also the user interface, the interaction design. Hmm. Those kinds of things were really, really impressed upon me by Bill Atkinson, Andy Hertzfeld, and Susan Kerr. Those, those, that was really when I discovered it and mm. I kind of woke up and said, wait a second, I'm in California now. I'm not in Michigan anymore. Yeah, no, this is great. <laughs> it's really fun. Dave, where are those boots from? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm from Montana, so, uh, and I, I went to school here in Colorado, so uh, I had to wear the boots. Um, they, although I believe they're from Texas. Yeah. Lucchese, which make the best cowboy boots. Um, my grandfather, I think, is responsible for my um, love of design. Uh, I grew up in a small town in Montana, Helena, and uh, my grandfather happened to be the vice president of the International Ski Federation, which is headquartered in Zurich. And so he would go to Switzerland almost every month, and he would bring back he would bring back Braun clocks from Germany and Leica cameras, and uh, you know, uh, I sort of. The Swiss design uh, philosophy was everywhere in his house. And so uh, I grew up going over to his house and sort of uh, uh, wondering how these products were created. And one of the products that was in his house that influenced me the most was the Macintosh. And um, I would say that um, the thing that led me down this path the most was HyperCard. Uh, uh, so the story starts with my grandfather and ends with HyperCard in that. Uh, when I was, I think, in third or fourth grade, I discovered HyperCard, which was a predecessor to the World Wide Web, and, uh, you know, enabled me, it, it was a very simple but powerful tool. You opened up a computer, and there was a screen that was blank, and you could draw on it, you could type text onto it, and then you could, uh, and it was not just a one, one card, it was a stack of cards, and you could take an element of that card and link it to another card and create games. You could create applications. And so I would spend my days after school, in elementary school, creating games, creating uh, you know, little applications using HyperCard. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, uh, I just fell in love with you know, the icon iconography of um, you know, Susan Kerr and the clip Bill art Atkinson. and the clip art Bill of Bill Atkinson, Atkinson you know, and uh, and the fonts of uh, you know uh, that Steve Jobs and the team had chosen and um, I think that sort of beget a love for, uh, you know, designing pixels for my entire life. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and not just pixels that are static, but interactive. Dynamic. Um, and I yeah. think I've basically been doing that ever, ever since. Ever since. Yeah. yeah. Mike? Well, it's so funny you say that because I was going to say exactly the same thing. HyperCard was absolutely um, elemental. You know, the thing that was so amazing, on top of building on what you said about it, you know, it... It had this idea that you could have a lowest common denominator set of things, just a few things, and you could build anything with them. And, uh, truly, and that really was Legos. truly amazing. Yeah, truly yeah. amazing. And, and that really was the forerunner to the web. I remember when I saw Mosaic for the first time. I don't know if you remember where you were when you saw Mosaic for the very first time, but I do. I remember when time night, what the weather was like, everything. <laughs> and, uh, and it was really just hypercard connected on a yep. network, right? And it's just. I totally agree. I think there's a whole generation of software designers, especially, that were deeply, deeply influenced yeah. by right. HyperCard. My co-founder was, if you, my co-founder was on the stage, he would say the same thing. And he was from northern British Columbia up near the Yukon and a happened to stumble upon HyperCard it's as amazing. well. So it, yeah. it, you know, permeates. Eve, is your story different? Um, yes, again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I grew up in Lausanne, Switzerland, next to uh, the IOC. Um, which mostly was in the news, not for good design, but for diverse types of can scandals and whatnot. Doping. <laughs> hmm? Doping? Uh, well, no, well, corruption, doping, okay. all kinds of things. Um, <laughs> Sports. <laughs> Sports. Um, but, so I grew up as a, as a, not in a family of design, but it's something I decided to do when I was 15 years old. Went to a little drawing school in my hometown. Essentially, it was retirees, that we're learning to draw, how to draw flowers and other things, and um, and teenagers, kind of, uh, you know, uh, dropout teenagers that were in there, and I had just finished my baccalauréat, so I was 18 or 19, and instead of going to university, I went to drawing school because I knew that that's what I wanted to do, um, and then I I studied in Switzerland and the U.S. and I committed European betrayal by moving as a designer to Silicon Valley, mm. um, a vast wasteland. 
<laughs> uh, uh, you know, pretty much all of, all of the interviews, you know, I, or all of the journalists or my friends um, saw that as, uh, as a moment of uh, sheer insanity. Um, but to me, there was a whole new territory that was being invented in the mid-90s in Silicon Valley. There was technologies, there were, you know, there were computers were taking home. Um, all these products were becoming, all these technologies were becoming personal. And they were undesigned, unrefined in many ways, uh, over-featured, but it, it was, it seemed like, um, I had, you know, for me it was a revelation. It was a, a new world where, um, as a designer, there was a big role to play, even though very few, there were very few people playing it. So you, you lead organizations, each of you, that are admired for great design. I want to go someplace we didn't talk about, but kind of go into your organization <clears throat> and ask about uh, what's the role for women in design? We've got an all male panel here. Are there female designers on your team? And if not, why not? What's going on? Who wants to take that? Everybody's yeah, got a everyone, thought. No We're ready. <laughs> so we absolutely have female designers. We have female designers and user experience and manual design, all of these different areas. Actually, our company is, for, for me at least, is very non-traditional Silicon Valley. We have 40% women in our company. Mm -hmm. And so that's really, really great because actually our brand is trying to be actually more female focused than male focused. So I want to actually get more women on the team. So absolutely the females, uh, are key when uh, in the design element and also the design of our marketing because mm -hmm. I want them to read that I want to see if it really resonates with them mm -hmm. they actually do a lot they're actually our writers you see that all as a whole it's continuum a absolute continuum yeah. from from packaging marketing a website all the way through the product other views on this topic uh, our director of design is uh, female and she's she's fantastic uh, before she was with us um, she spent a bunch of time in the uh, uh, the new uh, Science Museum in San Francisco uh, mm -hmm. and their brand identity and uh, she also worked with Design Within Reach doing furniture um, and these types of things. Are your designers also engineers? Do they program and write code? Some of them are. About, I would say half of them are. Half of them are uh, more aesthetically focused. But, and then we also have two, two more designers on the team. And our, our design team, you know, we're only a 50 person company but we have a 10 person design team. Uh, 10 out of 50? Yeah. And how is, many designers per engineers? Uh, let's see, so there's probably 30 engineers, so 30 that's engineers. your ratio. One yeah. designer for every three engineers every three. or so. Yeah. Is that what the numbers are like at Flipboard, Mike? No, uh, well, we have, uh, it's a lot of people who are, um, we have a few sort of trained designers and then a lot of other people who are doing design. Uh -huh. You know, product managers, engineers, uh, a lot of people are aspiring to do the design. So these are like so master, little, master designers, more. master apprentice or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Is it harder to recruit designers or software programmers? Both are incredibly hard. Both are dear. Both pretty both hard. Are designers. Hard. Designers harder than yes. programmers. Yeah. So what would be your... Well, the, I think the, there's a nuance. And you asked an important question, which is, <laughs> do, do, our designers, uh, do our designers write code? Yeah. And so we have two different types of designers of PATH product designers and graphic designers. Mm -hmm. And graphic designers don't write code, product designers do. And finding product designers is a true diamond in the rough problem, um, which is, you know, it's a, a, a person that has both the ability to write the software right. and do the design, right. uh, which to me is, the, is true craftsmanship in software design, where they truly understand all of the materials, not just the, the look and feel. Yeah. Um, and finding those, I think, uh, it's the hardest thing we do. Um, first, first of all, thank you for the uh, immigration, uh, moving in the right direction with the Immigration right. Act. We're all, we're I know you have a role in that. Um, it's, uh, we've been, essentially my company, we're 65 people. We've been a visa machine. I mean, we, we spent an enormous amount of time uh, looking at incredible talent um, you know, worldwide. And um, the last four hires are uh, Israel, Korea, <clears throat> France, and uh, Germany, and and we con continually hire people from all around the world, and women, uh, 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 sp sp you know, as well. We have about forty percent of our team is women. Um, we the person that's been with what, me. What, what percent of your design team? Um, about half and half, um, and and you know the, the the person who's been with me the longest, um, she's a designer from China, 
in my opinion, you know, uh, uh, somebody who's, there's, there's not many Chinese designers who've had nine, ten years of experience in the United States, so in my opinion, probably the best Chinese industrial designer that, that, um, that is around, that is alive. Hmm. Um, you, know, we, you know, we don't, the, 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 the one issue is that it's, it's actually, I, I'm surprised that we're able to have that many women designers on the team um, because in schools, it's still uh, 20, 80. When I went to school, it was 5% of industrial designers uh, were women and the rest were, were men. Now it's a 20, 80. So somehow they're coming to some of our companies and not going to other places. So this has taken us in a great direction. I'm gonna do a show of hands of the panel. How many of you believe that uh, great designers can be taught? And how many of you believe that great designers are born? There's something kind of nature and nurture in this equation. So how many think that you can, I want to be a great designer, I'm going to go to school, I'm going to learn to be great. No one. No one believes that. Well, uh, actually, uh, no, I would raise yeah, my hand. I, I, yeah. I think so. Yeah. I, I, would, I would put my hand You think part it of can't it can't be taught. I, yeah. I mean, part you have of to have the passion for it. it it's yeah. about the curiosity. It's yeah. really about the curiosity and understanding why things are the way they are. Now, you can train and you can get honed and refined, but it's about that initial curiosity. Yeah. And really trying to understand what's going right. on. Right, and you can't. In, you can't my, train that. It's like basketball. You can't coach height, right? Exactly. Yeah. My, 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 my. <laughs> you can't coach. Height. My question would be the reverse, um, because we do need good designers, and we do good, need good designers that are trained. Um, I mean, I did my ten thousand hours by the time I was probably twenty, twenty-one. Um, what but did you design for ten thousand hours? I drew. I drew. I, I mean, I had Not uh, calluses. <laughs> I had calluses all over my hands because. Yeah. Uh, drawing and the, the skills, the craft of design, making things, drawing, uh, conceiving them, um, is, is, is something that's extremely hard to do. It takes a long, long time to really get good at it. So that's what I focused to, to be good at. But um, my question would be the reverse. Um, we actually need, um, you know, Steve Jobs said, you know, great artists ship. Um, and my question to CEOs and new CEOs and and uh, entrepreneurs that talk, come, talk to them, not to you know, that come to my office is, you know, are you a great CEO that ships? Um, and what we what we need, I think, the, the the equation, the winning equation for me, is good design paired with incredible, um, you know, visionary, but also a level of taste, you know, a level of refinement Execution. in in in, uh, in in the CEOs that okay. we work with. Okay, now we're going to do a two-part question. You ready? I'm going to ask you. Which product in the world you would redesign or reinvent? Uh -oh. Something that's well positioned for improvement. <laughs> and, and, and then uh, secondly, excluding this panel, what's, what's a company or group whose designs you really admire? We're gonna begin with Tony. Okay, good. Well, let's start with a company I, you know, I admire, and it's not really in the tech space, but something that's really changed the way people consume coffee, and that's really Nespresso. Huh? Nespresso has done a tremendous job of their branding, of their design, the entire experience, their retail experience. It, they've added very little technology, but all of those things have just changed the nature. My wife is a junkie for Nespresso. So <laughs> when I see that, and she's telling all of her friends about it, and I see it all around the world, it's, they've done a really good job. Um, things I think that can really be redesigned, the car. The car. The absolutely the car, the interface on the car. It's, it's absolutely, you know, they're taking off buttons and they're putting on buttons. It's all about touch screens. It's, it's literally, you know, you know okay. designed as yours. Okay, so what would be in your ideal car? Well, the ideal car, um, <laughs> you know, there's, we, we won't get into self-driving versus, you know, regular driving. But, you know, for me, you know, we're trying to blend infotainment with safety and security and, and uh, proper driving. Mm. And, and what happens is we have all of these engineers and all these car companies worried about making you know, tw tweets from your dash and, you know, music from anywhere. And I'm like, guys, you're just trying to replicate Silicon Valley. You're not going to do it at each of these car companies. They have thousands of software engineers trying to do infotainment. Mm. And when I look at, we're all carrying these incredible devices with us that do everything for us. I see the car really as being, you know, as we used to be called in the 90s, keyboard display and mouse, yeah. right? You take your laptop and you'd hook up a keyboard display and a mouse. It was all the input to make it to be something bigger. We have the computers in our pockets. We have all the connectivity. Right. What we need is all the inputs and the outputs of the car mm. to blend that experience that we take with us personally mm. into the car experience. Mm. To me, that's 
uh, you know, we, we, we fought it so hard with iPod connectivity in a yeah. car and iPhone. We're still not even there yet. Not We're not close, even close. Not close. I can't wait to see the car you designed someday. <laughs> Dave Morin, two-part question, right? The product that's mo best positioned for reinvention and the company you admire. I think about healthcare a lot. Uh, and uh, in particular, I, I have a lot of friends having babies right now. And I visit them in the room. Uh, that you have to, you uh, and I talk about this all the time, that healthcare is sort of a blue ocean design problem. There's like so many design problems, it's hard to choose one. Hmm. Um, <laughs> Everywhere you turn. <laughs> yeah, literally. Uh, you know, most hospital rooms are these cold, uh, industrial, um, deeply unemotional experiences, yet the experiences that you have in them are the most emotional, most human experiences. And so, um, to me, I, look, it's not, I'm not an expert in this realm. Uh, most of my, I think I think about it because uh, I'm the black sheep in my family that didn't end up in medicine. My entire family, everyone uh, is doctors. And, uh, and, uh, and so I end up in these conversations about medicine and health. And so um, I think that there's, there's something missing from the way we're looking at design in that realm. Uh, and the company you admire the most, not here in design. Hmm. That's an interesting question. Well, we can come back to it. Mike McHugh. Uh, well, let's see. I mean, uh, I think a company that just comes to mind is a great company. I think is really doing some great design work is Virgin America. They're designing the the whole the whole process of being on a plane, and I love that. And the thing that I would love to do to uh, you know in, in a in a um, in another life would be to design a better airplane. Uh, a fundamentally better airplane, something that would be probably supersonic, something that would be substantially more comfortable, uh, easier to board. Um, I think there's just so much. It's incredible how, many, how much innovation happened in, you know, I don't know, 40, 50 years, and it just stopped. And planes really haven't gotten any better in, what, 30 years. Uh, I mean, they've gotten marginally better, but there's been no breakthrough. Nothing major, so I would, I would do that. Okay. <clears throat> My turn? Yeah. All right, so, um, so uh, car uh, companies I, I, I truly admire. Herman Miller is an incredible company. Before we talked about, before we, we, you know, we think that Apple is um, the only kind of, or the, the best representation today of American design in some ways, you know, Apple certainly has this role, but historically, Herman Miller has been there, you know, all the way through since the 40s and the 50s and doing extraordinary things with, with incredible designers. So I, I feel incredibly fortunate that I'm able to work with them. And when it comes to, and I think that we'll probably talk about that, but when it comes to how you, you manage design and do it for like 70 years in a row um, and you, you keep coming out with the best products in the market, I think um, I think they're they're incredible. As far as um, um, well, one one little thing about Nespresso. So when we moved into our new office uh, six weeks ago, um, we got a couple of uh, we got a Nespresso machine and a whole bunch of capsules. Um, and after a day and a half, all the capsules were gone. And I was like, I don't even drink coffee. I'm like, what's going on? They my team consumed 600 capsules in <laughs> in. In a it's, day and a half. It's, amazing, it's, an it's like great business, great business, no doubt. Um, so, so as far as the things that drive me crazy or that need really to be rethought from a design standpoint, certainly the car. Um, the car essentially is where, where technology was in the 90s. Um, 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 uh, certainly healthcare. Um, it's incredible how much money goes in there and how little design, human factors, ergonomics. Um, you know how, how little we think about any of that, um, but I'll I'll I'll, um, I'll jump in here with something else, something different, which is I believe the screen interface is the next um, product that we need, the next frontier that we need to redesign. Um, we spend way too much time on our screens. There's a few of you there. Um, we 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 have. We, we're glued to this, to this glowing um, thing in front of us, and it's actually becoming a problem. So my, I'm interested in how we, how we go beyond the screen. Beyond the screen. Yeah. Well, that's great. That's how, awesome. many, how many of you have worn Google Glass? Hand in the air, please. Uh, 
What do you think? I, I think that there is potential. I think we're still trying to figure out the applications of when it should be used. It, should it be used in a face-to-face -face setting? Yeah. Should it only be used on a? <laughs> should it only be used when you're, you know, uh, in, in mobile and there's nobody with you? I think those are the kind of things we're going to figure out over time. But it's great to have this experiment running and let's see what happens. Yeah, Dave, you've written software for it, haven't you? Yeah, we were the first application to integrate with Google Glass, and so. Um, I guess we look at it from kind of a context point of view, where uh, the most important thing, you know, this is the first version of this interface, mm. and as, it, as the interface gets better and they look like the glasses that I'm wearing now, what's the most important question? And I think the, the most important question is that, uh, you know, or statement is that context is king, and how do you provide people with very contextual information uh, and streams of data that make sense? and uh, answer questions for them before they have to ask them. And that, we still have a very long way to go uh, in terms of creating that, uh, that information. And so that's, that's what we focus on. Mm. How big do you think it'll be someday? That market? Yeah. Uh, immense. Immense, very large, <laughs> yeah. bullish. Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, it, we have to get somewhere in terms of uh, the fashion and the usability and you know, all these things, but uh, it, it's definitely coming. It's a happening thing. Yeah. Mike. Well, I, you know, if you think about it as augmented human sight, you know, that is a very big deal. And the lines there are blurry, no pun intended, but it's a very, um, it's a very big deal. You're fusing humans and technology together at deeper and deeper levels, and it's a trend that will play out over the course of the next 50 years and have profound societal and, uh, you know, moral implications. and. It's a very, very big deal. There's no question this is the beginning of something huge. Great in medicine, um, great in some specific applications, um, uh, sort of B2B type of, of applications. But try to go in a bar and pick somebody, someone up with, with, with Google Glass. <laughs> you have your New York City condoms in your Google Glass. <laughs> <laughs> The, I will two, say the, though, two, the, the, the two uh, are, don't work together very well. <laughs> I, I will say, though, you've, you know, you've made Bluetooth headsets cool enough to go into bars, so yeah. I don't see how he can't. I think it's a great it challenge for you. Yeah. And there's some kind of human <laughs> interface involved in Put us in touch. Did you see that Saturday Night Live skit? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was awesome. I saw yeah, that. Very good. That was great. Um, yeah. Mm. Peacock. So, <laughs> password, peacock. <laughs> Each of you is extraordinarily accomplished in your own right. So I want to ask you one piece of advice. If someone came to you and said, give me some really good advice about starting a company, doing design, living a full life. So this is a wide open question. What's your best advice? Well, you know, we all, are on this earth to do something, and we all have to find our purpose. And usually it's through our heroes that we see maybe some part of ourselves. And so for me, uh, I really encourage uh, students and various people who come up to me for advice, when they're gonna start a company, I say, go and work with your heroes. Go learn from them. If there's so much, you, it's so much, they need great passionate people behind them to help them do what they do they will also mentor you. Mm. And you'll be able to be that next generation as mm. well, just like General Magic embraced me when mm. I was just a little nobody. And so those, I think that's really, really important. Is that's how we stand on the shoulders of each generation, mm. is to go by working with our heroes. Find your heroes. Yeah. That's, that's Thank awesome. you for that gift. Dave. I think my best advice, uh, entrepreneurial advice, is to start. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Wear sunscreen. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, most people, you know, I, I get a lot of young entrepreneurs, they come to me um, and they say, what, you know, what do I do? I have this idea and I've been thinking about it for three years or four years or 10 years. Um, and most people just uh, don't start. And I think that starting is the most important step. And uh, once you make that step, then what you have to do is trust the process of entrepreneurship to teach you the lessons. Um, and I think that's, that's the most important lesson is that once you cross over that barrier, um, you, know, uh, you begin to learn so many lessons and it's such an immense amount of personal growth. It, it, it's a totally different path, as it were, right? <laughs> and um, 
I think that that's, that's the most important thing is that, is that you start um, and, uh, and, and, and then trust the process. Trust the force, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really love both of those pieces of advice. I, I'll, I'll narrow mine um, around more about product, building great products, so if, especially for consumer markets. So I have something I call the mom test, and I always talk to our team about when you're sitting down at Thanksgiving and your mom asks, so what are you doing? What are you building? And if you start to give an answer and she's kind of, her eyes are glazing over and she doesn't really understand what you're saying, you know you're off to a bad start. And so there's like three parts of the mom test. When you describe what you're doing, she needs to say, oh, that's really cool. I, and you know, I'd like to use that. So she needs to understand it. She needs to want to actually use it. And then she has to actually be able to use it. And if, th if think about it, there are very few products that pass all three of those tests. And so uh, that's one that uh, I talk about with my team. The light mom. The mom test. I would say for me, for somebody who starts, um, to start where, where they're really passionate um, is, is really key. I mean, Tony and I used to go to you know, dance clubs and concerts and listening to music all the time. I mean, he was all about music. And so it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not surprising that you ended up you know, creating the iPod. I mean, you had it in your head for probably 10 years before it even came out. Um, and I, you know, I would say that's, you know, just, just find what drives you and, um, you know, and use the other two uh, pieces of advice there and you'll, you'll get there. If you, if you do those three or four things, um, <laughs> you, you, you're in good shape. Good thank, thank, thank you, each of you, for those gifts. I'm, I'm not going to remember them. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a little bit of time now for questions, and, and I want to make the most of it. Here's the format. You put your hand in the air, you'll get a mic. And I'm going to ask you to direct your question to someone on the panel. It's Tony, Dave, Mike, and Eve. And I'll let one other panelist build on that answer, but we're not going to have everybody talk about every question. Uh, and, and I wish you'd begin by saying, my name is da 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 from this organization, and end your question with a question mark. So we'll go really fast. No speeches. Mike there. And your name is? Hi, I'm Tara LeMay, CEO of Net Power and Light. And I know some of the panelists well. Um, as the CEO of a tech company that's design driven, we have filed a lot of patents, both hardcore technology and design patents. How are you guys looking at IP, uh, particularly Tony, because he's had some interesting challenges. But I would also say, Mike, you come from core tech, or he's, either one of you would probably think about this as well. Great. Mike, please, please. <laughs> I might have a very different <laughs> Well, um, let's see. Mm, uh, I mostly uh, try not to get too focused on it, frankly, right now at the moment. Um, that may be a bad thing in the long run, but we just try to focus on great product, and I don't worry too much about IP. That said, we are, you know, we do have a process to put together patents, but um, I haven't spent a lot of time and energy on it as of yet. Tony, do patents matter in your business? Uh, well, you were the one who asked me way back when, when you first invested. And because we're actually going after entrenched markets with really big competitors, long-time competitors, we need patents for a defensive purpose. So yeah. absolutely, we've, we've taken it to heart and actually we hired Apple's uh, chief of intellectual property really? to be our GC. And you had, a, you had a big company sue you because... We've already we've had yeah. one big company sue us. We've had a couple of trolls. And, uh, you know, I've, I've learned how to play that game because we got sued every week at Apple. And Chip, our GC now, was the guy next to me there. And so so you're we just play We just play that play out. Play it straight down the middle. It's Another question here, play. please. Microphone. Name. I'm Kurt Malkoff. I'm a PhD clinical psychologist. This is to Tony. Uh, looking at Net Nest, is it more important from a tech design standpoint to look cool or to do cool? <laughs> well, I, 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 really, I really segment that into rational and emotional arguments when you do a design. So for me, really, there's all kinds of rational reasons why you should buy a product. But if you don't, especially in what we do, a thermostat, right? Crazy, we want to go worry about a thermostat. You have to have those emotional elements in that design because you want to hook people, you want them to care and love it, not just say it's going to save me energy or save me money. So there's got to always be a great blend in the product, and then that can actually then be exposed through our disruptive marketing so we can hit di different targets, whether that's 
you know, the female audience or the, the male audience or design-focused audience, you need to have a nice blend of rational and emotional to really get a wide audience to look at what you're doing. Who's got a mic? You have a mic. Do you have a question? Do you have a question? <laughs> Hi, Shelley Porges, Washington, D.C., ready for Hillary Pack. My question actually is to you, John. And that is, when you look to invest in a company, what role does design play, actually? Because, you know, classically, we think of VCs investing because of the size of the market and the problem you're solving and, you know, all these more arguably rational things. But actually, here you are with your magnificent designers here. Can you share with us a little bit of your process? Sure, it's very important because I, I think uh, you have to have great design to be competitive and to be successful in today's markets. So. When we look at the commitment of the CEO to design, uh, we want to be blown away by the product and by their vision, their reimagining of what is or their vision of what ought to be in each of these companies. It's a great example of that. Another question in the mic, please. Um, Anton van Achmel, I found an emerging markets investment firm, but my question is whether, uh, and for Eve, uh, is um, 3D printing changing your life as a designer in a fundamental way? Great question. 3D printing. <clears throat> so 3D printing is, um, it's, it's, um, it, it always makes me laugh because it's as if it just appeared a couple of years ago, but we've actually been using 3D printing for 20 years. Um, uh, industrial designers and engineers were the first ones to use 3D printing, then architects discovered it and went all crazy for it. Um, and now, you know, people are, are thinking about um, um, having those, uh, you know, as as um, in their own workshops, in their own garages, in their own houses. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I think it's great. I think it's great that the tools have become so much easier. Um, there is certainly a de de democratization of the tools of design that allows people to, um, you know, to build new things, but also you know, to maybe launch new things. I mean, there's, there's a number of companies that have launched um, you know, to go back to the sort of designers at the center of, of entrepreneurship um, that have launched companies based on the ease of access of those tools, the, the ease of financing, you know, through Kickstarter and, and, um, and then move on from there. I mean, we, another, you know, another view one. of 3D printing here? Well, I, I think 3D printing, it's, it, it, it's an amazing technology, as, as you've said, democratized. You can now, just like you had laser printing yeah, back yeah. in the day, you have 3D printing. It's great. But, you know, people are already going to, you know, you're going to be able to print anything out now and there's not going to be retail or even e-tail, you just do it. You know, we're so, what we're seeing today in the 3D printing world is, ex is very similar to what we saw 20 years ago. It's no. just that the machines are more accessible. The materials, some of it has changed slightly, but you, you can only do mechanical parts. It's not gonna print out an iPhone per se, or a, a jawbone or something like that. It's just not gonna happen, not yet, but maybe my kids. Question back here, yes sir. This, my name is Greg, I'm one of this year's scholars. Um, I have a question for Tony. Um, first, and just thank you for letting us all be here. I think one of the things is someone who is excited to be here and hear about ideas. Uh, John, I think it's great that you spend all this time asking truly about ideas and not just the finances and the, the financial benefits that come from these great ideas. And I was curious for Tony, is it a coincidence that people who have created and designed things based on such great ideas but don't seem to talk about the money is that a coincidence, or do you think that's something that's truly inherent in being so successful, that you're focused on the ideas themselves? You, you always, you focus on the ideas, you focus on the product, you focus on the execution and the passion of the team around that. The money will come. People feel it through the product. They see it through the product. You don't have to talk about the money. And they tell their friends about the product. You don't focus on the money. You never do that. It's, it's the death of the company, as far as I'm concerned, or the death of design. You know, we saw what happened to General Motors, right? Now they're getting their, trying to get their mojo back. They were all about bean, they were all about design in the 50s and, and starting in the 60s. The bean counters came and talked about money. The company was a disaster. And now it's trying to get back its mojo. So you don't talk about the money. You don't it, focus on it. It has to be about the feeling, I think. You know, in the internet business, in, uh, Especially in social networking, we focus on the feeling that you create for someone. You know, how do they feel when they use the product? And I think if you can focus on that and the values that you're trying to create, then you know, the money follows that. Jessica? Yes, Jesse Willie Wilson, CEO of Dreambox Learning. I, I have a question really for Eve. Can you talk about failure and how your organization metabolizes failure and its relationship to innovation? Um, great question. So, 
Um, if you want to design anything, if you want to start anything, you have to be ready to fail every single day. Um, um, why is it that we make 70 different prototypes of, um, of the sail chair, for example, for Herman Miller? Is because every single one of them is a failure, but at the same time, every single one of them is a step forward. Um, so, so you know, in design, it's about iteration, it's about refinement, it's 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 um, it's really about never taking your eye off what could be better. So, in a sense, we you know probably like a personality trait you know in designers is that um, they're never fully satisfied um, because it could always be a little a little better by by the smallest increments. Failing means learning. But you have to ship it. Right. Yeah, you have to ship, ship too. Ship, so you have to stop at some point. Yes? Uh, Mary Dorr, Brown University. Um, you've given us your general advice for budding designers and entrepreneurs. I'm wondering what the most important or relevant or most commonly lacking skill is for aspiring designers or entrepreneurs that you see these days. Well, I mean, I see a lot of, we see, we see, you know, probably 50 to 100 portfolios uh, a week um, um, in our office. And I would say the, the um, you know, the, the biggest problem isn't the skills, you know, the skills are either there or not. Um, it's really the independent uh, thinking, the ability to sort of both fit in, sort of come into a team and, and deliver what's expected of you, and, and, um, but also to stand out um, with your own ideas, with your own, um, your own vision, your own contribution. Um, and I would say, you know, a lot of this, a lot of the schools, a lot of the school system out there is really more focused on getting um, kids, students to, you know, to fit within a certain box. Um, and what you need in design, what you need in, in entrepreneurship is actually people not to fit in so well. Mm -hmm. there's, there's one thing I'd like to add. I, we, I see designers all the time and they come to me after talks or whatever. And they're like, I want to be your head of design. I want to be your head of UI. And I'm like... Why don't, you know, I, I don't see a lot of humbleness a lot of times and just like, hey, how about we all work together and let's figure this out. So it was always great, like I came out of so-and-so design school. It's like, let's, let's kind of practice it a little together. Well, before you, That's a great you, note on which to close. Let me tell you, I cannot believe how fast this hour has flown by because it could go on for a lot longer, except Kitty would not allow it. So <laughs> we've gone from... Uh, personal stories of how we began design to hypercards and condoms and cars and planes and blue running shoes <laughs> and entrepreneurship. Please join me in uh, thanking <laughs> Tony, Dave, Mike, and Eve. Ladies and gentlemen, just one, one quick thing um, before you end your day. First of all, I'd also like a round of applause for John Doerr, who's a trustee. And He's just a great interviewer. Um, we have a career for you, John, if you ever need another one. Um, in the Greenwald tent, the Secretary of the Treasury is going to speak and address questions for about a half an hour, starting at 5.30. And because so many of you are at our design session, and this is the first full day, you may not know this, but we've had last few days a number of salons at 6 p.m. in the Marble Garden tent. I know it's raining, but we're going to do it anyway. It won't be wet in there with IDEO, which is a design thinking firm, and they're gonna ask you about how to think about education tonight and about health tomorrow night. Wine, food, really good conversation, so we invite you to do that, participate.